Hi, Mark. Thanks very much for having me on the show. So I am a food futurist. And the first question I get when I tell people that is, what's a food futurist? <laughs> yeah. I hate to tell the audience, I am not a fortune teller. I cannot tell them the winning lottery numbers. I can't tell them who's going to win the next Super Bowl. I'm sorry about that. I disappoint <laughs> people. Because if I could do something like that, I would be on my mega yacht on the French Riviera in Saint-Tropez. <laughs> But, but of course, I'd, well, really, I'd much rather be here anyway at FedEx Santa Barbara, of course. But, um, you know, so that's what I can't do. But what I can do is look at things in food and ag and look at what we call alternative futures, way in which the future could eventuate. And I like to look at the ways in which I think the future should eventuate. I, I like that you made that distinction for us. And... Uh, when we talk about the future, I think it's good to sometimes look in our rearview mirror and look at the past and kind of learn some lessons from the past. I think the challenge that we have right now is with an exploding population and climate change and kind of all of these forces all at the same time, there are unique challenges around growing food and proteins and, and the choice of foods. And do we go to a world of Soylent Green where we just take a pill? Um, so pick any one of those threads to start with, sir. Well, I think you're right. I think the thing is, uh, there's a saying I love, which is if hindsight is a wonderful thing, foresight is even better. Mm. And foresight is what we need. We've seen that we haven't had a lot of foresight in terms of climate change, certainly not in the in a general population sense and political sense that is now starting i think to 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 come home and as you said we are faced with this inevitable fact that we are going to have nearly 10 billion people on the planet by 2050 and the other inescapable fact we have is that if we look at what we can produce healthily equitably and keenly sustainably using our current global agricultural system is that much protein but we need that much mm. protein, that much mm. food by 2050. So how do we fill that gap? I mean, we could just deforest the entire planet and grow more food, but I'd suggest that's probably not going to end well. Um, so what do we do? How do we maximise our resources? How do we healthily and equitably feed the planet? But key, it's got to be done sustainably. Yeah, that because that for, for all the for all the obvious reasons, we had Dr. Stephen Gaines on uh, earlier in the show, uh, talking the series, talking about um, the amount of land it takes to grow the protein to fill that gap. And I think he said it was something like the size of Africa, like we're going to need that much land. And he is um, a proponent of aquaculture. And he said, the similar amount of protein to, to meet those needs could be done in the five miles off the coast of New Zealand, just the upper island. So if you just aqua farmed. So I'm, yep. I'm curious, is it going to be that kind of just a complete mind shift? The thing is, if we look at it, let's look at it from the point of view, we had a lot of people saying, you know, want to destroy animal agriculture by 2035 and all these sorts of things. I think there are two things to realize there. One is if we stop raising animals for food tomorrow, about two months, no chickens. There goes most of our meat protein. Six to nine months, no pigs. Two years, no, no beef. Now, how do we fill that gap? You know, there's just the, the change is going to be a transition. And I think we're going to need all sources of protein for decades to come whatever views may be on animal cruelty and industrial farming. Sure. I mean, it's the reality is to replace 10% of the global meat supply in 2030 requires an expenditure, according to the Good Food Institute, 1.8 trillion US mm. dollars of capital investment. Now, I'm a techno-optimist. I believe technology can do virtually anything, proper application of technology can solve any problem. So let's say they get it down to only a trillion dollars. I like round numbers. So that's 125 billion US dollars of capital expenditure every year between now and 2030. I would suggest that's not going to happen. So I have, I have a quick question, Tony. Cultivated meat. Yes. What are they spending the money on? So that's lab meat? 
Yeah, this is a lab. Sorry, I should say, yeah, this is cultivated Got meat, cultured Got meat. It. So basically to replace 10% of the global supply of meat with cultivated meat would require that, that amount of money. Um, now, that's simply not going to happen. It's not going to happen this year, that's for sure. It's not going to happen next year. So we're looking at, at some point, three or four hundred billion dollars in one year worth of capital expenditure in terms, you're right, Mark, factories, um, but land, factories, equipment, and to fully commercialize any new technology, um, you need some degree of capital expenditure. For cultivated meat, it's quite high because it's quite a high technology. Right. And then you go back down to some of the other ones require less. But that's simply not going to happen. If we reach, in my view, a couple of percent of cultivated meat um, term in global terms by 2030, I think we'll be doing very, very well. So let's go back to the original question that you propose is how how do we feed 10 billion people by 2050? So a 2% solution here, a 1% solution here, uh, you know, that doesn't feel like it scratches the itch. Yeah, look, I think you're right. I think what we need is a combination of technologies and a combination of um, strategies. So I think putting our eggs in any one basket, I mean, I, I hear quite often, but we grow enough food to feed the planet now. And in theory, that's correct. And I say, yeah, look, there's the world as we would like to see it, and there's the world as it is. And the world as it is can't use that amount of food to feed the planet for so many reasons. Food waste is a big one, reducing food waste, right. maximizing the amount of right. food we get from the food we grow is essential. Um, I think the one that I heard from the World Resources Institute at one stage is paraphrase them. All we have to do is stop people who eat too much, eating as much, and send it to the people who need it. And my reply to that is, we've been telling people in industrialised countries like Australia, US and Europe, don't eat so much or you will die of lifestyle-related diseases. Now we're going to say, now, instead of that, could you please just eat less so we can send it elsewhere? I don't think that's going to work. So I think that what we need, Mark, is to look at these new technologies that are coming into food. I've never seen anything like it in over 30 years in the food industry and apply those as one of our strategies for growing enough food to sustainably, healthily and equitably feed the population of the planet. So the is, it a, is it a technology that optimizes growing food or is it some kind of new food replacement that you see the future in? I think there's several tacks in there. One is, yes, increasing crop yields. So we have all sorts of things like AI being used for accelerated breeding. Mm. That would be good to get the growth traits and protein and so on. Um, then we have Excuse me, Tony, how, how, do you, how do you square the, the GMO controversy inside of that? Because now we have AI GMO and that's got a race in my brows probably. This is non-GMO. So what you do is with a rise in genetics, you can do the genetic sequencing of various cultivars of a crop. And AI says, take this cultivar with that cultivar and cross that, gotcha. then cross that one with that one. Gotcha. And it accelerates the breeding process. Now you can use gene editing and G GMO. Um, but you're saying you don't need to. You don't need to. Got I it. Think, I think that using GMO, um, I don't have issues with that, but that's probably for another day. Um, but um, yeah, so you can accelerate the, the, the plant breeding process. And we've got a company called uh, Benson Hill. They have very high protein soy. I think it's about 50% more protein than the usual soy. And they've done that specifically so that they can use that soy crop to grow um, products that can be used for alternative proteins. Because let's face it, soy was never designed to be grown to make protein. It's oil. Right. Right. Now, if you grow it for the protein instead and the oils, the byproduct or a secondary product, that's a whole different ball game as well. And then you have a company called Pivot Bio. They have a soil microbiome. Now they can reduce the nitrogen um, usage by about 40 pounds per acre, mm. about 45 kilos per hectare. Um, and that's about 20% for crops like corn and wheat. And that gives the same yields. They've planted over 3 million acres so far um, and their products working really, really well. So we don't end up with the runoff and the dead zones that we see like in the Gulf of Mexico every year, which is just horrendous. So um, 
So look at you, when you talked about how many million acres. Um, I, I'm I'm thinking about the land that we have available, and two things come to mind. One is we we're an ocean planet, and mm -hmm. um, we talked earlier about what you know what they've done in New Zealand. Uh, we had a couple of young men who were post grads out of a university in in England who have figured out how to modify rice to be able to have the rice exist under saltwater conditions. Mm. And now they, they're growing these mile wide patties uh, in the ocean that's, that's perfect. Have you seen, but in addition to that, it feels like we could, you know, grow things in the ocean that it, rather than just harvesting kelp, which I know we can do, we've done those kinds of things, but other crops, what, what, what's the future of that? I, I think you're right, Mark. That is again, another um, avenue that we should be exploring. Because as you say, basically we're an ocean planet. We shouldn't be right. called Earth, it should be called water. Yeah. Um, planet water. <laughs> that's funny. Um, but, you know, <laughs> but you know, that still requires whole new technologies and ways yeah. of growing food. We're talking crops in agriculture versus mm -hmm. agriculture of fish and animals. Correct. And that's a whole different ball game. And as we know, I mean, we, we have enough problems um, with our climate on land, on mm -hmm. sea. Um, I think that's something else that needs to be taken into account is just how um, stable and how reliable it's going to be um, where we can grow aquaculture crops, if you like. Well, I'm, I'm thinking when Epcot Center at Disney opened some would have to fact check me on this, but was probably 40 years ago, they had the first working hydroponic gardens at scale uh, that we could see. Um, I don't know that we're, we've really done that at scale. Mm -hmm. And now um, I met up with a, a man this spring who does vertical farming, and he's having a really hard time um, making the economics work yet when you you talk to them and you we had vertical cricket farming on the show early on um so it it feels like we we have space vertically that we could be playing with so so here's here's the question tony it feels like there are these spot solutions where people are doing things what's it gonna take for there to be a seismic shift in in our capability one of the things that um, that's going on at the moment is, of course, a lot of the technologies we're looking at are being implied in applied in already industrialized countries, global with established food systems. My view is we need to look at where the next big demand for, for food is going to be, which is throughout Southeast Asia and particularly right. in coming decades in Africa. Let's face it, our current food system has done a really good job of feeding a lot of the planet, the 60s Green Revolution, saved billions from starvation but as we know it hasn't been without its problems massive um, nitrogen and phosphorus inputs runoff greenhouse gas emissions everything else so my view is that what we need to look at is rather than taking the current view of what we do is we grow food over here and we send it all the way over here and i think under covid and the ukraine war it's shown us that that is not necessarily a good idea Mm. And I think that if we look at some of these new technologies that can be used that are, don't require arable land and produce large amounts of protein and say to countries that are developing their food systems, hey, yes, you can copy us if you want to, but don't forget, we've got a lot of problems we need to clean up. Here's some alternatives and look at how we um, advise or make available to countries with growing populations that there are other ways of doing it than the way that we do it now. There's a company called Solar Foods. They take um, their patented machinery, they suck in the air, they separate out the moisture, carbon dioxide and nitrogen. They turn the nitrogen into ammonia and then they split the water into hydrogen and oxygen using solar energy, so Solar Foods. They combine them with some microbes and minerals and they grow what's called biomass. Now, people might say, what is biomass? I don't know how many people who are listening know the infamous Australian Vegemite, mm. um, that black paste that Australians love to mm -hmm. put on their, uh, on their mm -hmm. bread and toast. That is biomass. That's yeast. 
that has been turned into a paste. You can turn yeast and other microbes into a protein source similar to things like soy protein concentrates and soy protein isolates. So you can grow food with no arable land, virtually no fresh water. And they say that if you have um, an area the size of Utah, you could feed the protein for the entire world if you put that under solar panels with their process. So, so that gives me some hope. And I, I was just, we were talking before we went on air about AI and the impact of AI. And I know you're, you're working uh, in lockstep on that. But it, what got me thinking was, okay, so I'm thinking Soylent Green, I'm thinking this green biomass, but it means a way <laughs> better name than that. Uh, but will there be a time, and then I'm thinking of deep fakes, right? So we can deep fake a person, can we deep fake food? So we, we already know we're doing that with hamburger and meatballs and they're, they're starting to do that. So we, we, it looks like something we're familiar with, but mm. probably three generations from now, that's only 60 years, three generations from now, will that kind of food source be the norm? Do you have a prognostication for us? I think that by 2030 and beyond, we're gonna see products in the food system on supermarket shelves, restaurants, cafes, food service that we've never seen before. I think there are a whole range of ingredients out there that are gonna be used to make these products. And I think some of those ingredients and products are just an idea in some startup founder's mind um, today. So I think that say, I'm a techno optimist. I believe there's no problem on the planet that can't be solved through the proper application of technology which is what we've done as a human species to survive this far. We've kept applying technologies to problems as they come up, and that's how we've survived to date. Tony, thank you so much for helping us. This, this problem is like hard to get done in a few minutes, but thank you so much for having this conversation. No, that's no problems, Mark. And as you say, I think there are different ways of thinking about the global food system. And I think if we don't just think about it, with tunnel vision of just cloning more of what we do now, and we apply human ingenuity and technology to the problem, we can solve the issue of feeding 10 billion people by 2050.